Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this RTS Wales event, The Making of Doctor Who. My name is Judith Winnan, and I'm the chair of the RTS Wales Centre. Um, and before I go any further, I just want to say huge thanks to our panel, Simon Winston, Errol Wynne Jones, and Ed Russell, uh, for uh, doing this evening's event. But whilst I have got a wonderfully uh, captive audience, I just want to say a few words about RTS Wales. Um, we're an educational charity, and this is one of many events we put on over the course of the year. And um, one event that I should particularly uh, announce to this audience, if you're not aware already, is that we will be holding our annual student awards. The RTS Student Awards are in their 24th year now, and we hold them each year. And next year, in February, they will be held here on, uh, yeah, on February the 6th. Um, the deadline for those awards is imminent. It's next week. So if there are any students in the room who were thinking of entering, um, please go to the RTS website and uh, look at the formalities for entering. But excitingly, this week, we made an announcement, which is that we're growing our awards. Um, basically extending them into the industry. So we've added two new categories this year uh, for industry professionals, who are not students, but people actually working in paid roles in TV. Um, as a sort of natural progression to the student awards, we've introduced a newcomer uh, and a breakthrough award. So those are for people who are in their first paid roles in the industry. They're the rising stars. They're the ones who are going to be, you know, head of BBC in the future or whatever. But they are basically people who are just breaking through in the industry. So we're really excited about that. We think it's a great way to grow and build on the student awards that we do currently. And the deadline for that is December the 1st. And people need to be nominated by the company that they're working for. Um, but again, more details of that are on uh, the RTS website. Um, if you're on the website, please also do look at uh, joining us. If you like what we do, and we'd love your support, membership is free for students, and a mere £65 uh, for those of you who, uh, who, aren't, who are no longer studying. Um, and there's various benefits, not least. Um, you get to hear first about all our events. You get a glossy television magazine every month, and there's various sort of deals as well that we uh, broker with uh, local hotels, etc. So it really is uh, worth looking into. Um, and with that, I think I'll just now hand over to our chair for this evening, Ed Russell. And please give Ed a, a round of applause. Is my microphone on? Yes, it is. You can hear me. Um, well, before I speak to our panellists, I think we should just talk about Dog 2 and, and have a look at... Uh, uh, a trailer for the new series, which started just over two weeks ago, just over one week ago, actually. Um, can we play in that trailer, please? Get a little flavour of Doctor Who, series 11. Any clip? Any clip? <laughs> <laughs> it's fated. Here we go. We've got something. Brilliant, absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Just so I can get an idea of our audience, I'm assuming you're all either Doctor Who fans or here because you want to know a bit about Doctor Who, yes? And you, have you all watched last week's episode, episode one? Well, it seems most people did. Um, so it was announced today, I think it's got the highest ratings ever for a first episode in the series of Doctor Who. So congratulations to everyone that's involved in it. Um, you both are involved to some degree in Doctor Who. So, so Simon, as head of drama for BBC Studios Wales, if you give me your two sentence... Head of drama, comma, Wales, BBC Studios oh, production. Sorry, yes. If you give me your two sentence, what you do for BBC Wales or Studios? Um, on the basic level, I'm in charge of the enormous building down in the bay. Um, so I, I get the term base lead, which means a lot of people ask me about the car park. <laughs> Um, and I technically oversee Doctor Who and all other dramas coming out, because Roethlock, for those people who know how studios work and what's made in 
in the BBC, both Lock also carries both probably, well, casualty, probably come, and they're both, they both come under CDS, the Continuing Drama Team. Absolutely. Continuing Drama being a posh name for soap. Well, I say that, but it's not just, oh, it's, I mean, it's just continuing. Okay. Just continuing. Just non-stop. Non-stop. Um, and Arwell, as your production designer for Doctor Who, Series 11, very briefly, what, what is that? Um, a whole heap of trouble. Uh, <laughs> it's um, a production designer. You're in charge of the overall look of the show and the, and the world it encompasses, really. So, yeah. you know, the, um, the universe, if you like, of, of the show. Rather a large universe for Doctor uh, Who. <laughs> yes, you know, and, and there's, um, you have certain elements that you have to adhere to, obviously, because it's been such a long-running show. It yeah. has so much love. Um, but all, equally, you, you know, you want to create newness as well. Well, we'll talk about specifics of Series 11 shortly, but if, if, imagine us getting into a virtual TARDIS and travelling back to the year 2005, four, even. Uh, you've both been involved in Doctor Who in the past, so if I could talk a bit about that. Simon, you were... Well, actually, you go back, back way before you joined BBC Wales in the world of Doctor Who. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm... Having been... Yes, having essentially been a slightly obsessive fan in my youth and had all the Target novelizations and all that kind of thing, um, and being told relentlessly by my parents that it would come to nothing. This is my now my third Doctor Who related job. <laughs> um, so I was initially, my first actual proper creative job was at Virgin Publishing, which um, had a slightly curious office where at one side there was Doctor Who and the other side was Black Lace Erotica. <laughs> uh, uh, Black Lace and Nexus Erotica. Um, I hope you so, were in the Doctor Who side. Well, we, we did do some swapping. Um, it, it, <laughs> it kept the copy editing quite low. Um, and kept it interesting, but um, it is, yeah, so that's kind of, and so people like Russell was working there, Mark Gatiss did that, Stephen wrote for those, so there's a huge amount of people who, you know, at that time when Doctor Who was not on screen, it was a really great creative play, place for, to keep the, keep the show alive. Keep the, the flame yeah. going. But Indeed. you then became, your route into TV was then as a script editor or, or working on um, scripts? I, I, I um, so actually, in, in, again, initially slightly through someone, uh, Gareth Roberts, who was kind of writer, he, um, he, he and somebody else, they got work on Emmerdale. And they then let me know that there was a workshop that for p p essentially potential storyliners on Emmerdale, which they, they got me in, so that's, that's great. Um, I then had to fight to the death 40 other people. Um, at the end, uh, there was a, there was a, there was a, the end point was actually getting a job, so I did Emmerdale for about 18 months storylining, and then went on to EastEnders. Do you have to learn mm. about farming goats? And, and um, there was quite. A, it, I loved. I genuinely love him. I'm so excited that Kim Tate is back. I know. What is not to love about Absolutely. that? I just. I mean, the the end. Where just as I was arriving, I remember that was essentially Kim Tate was leaving, and the moment when she does the the mirror on his, which I still think is probably one of the best. Mo if anyone hasn't seen it, it's one of the best soap villainy moments when she's leaving. She's leaving town. Her husband is trying to stop her. Frank Tate, he kills over, he has a heart attack, <laughs> and you think she's going to help him, and she gets a mirror out and just basically checks he's breathing. <laughs> <laughs> and just when she's sure he's not breathing, she checks her lipstick in the same mirror and gets the hell out on the helicopter. Um, and that's, that's kind of, I think that's my level of drama from that moment on. Yeah, Camp Villainess's tend to uh, <laughs> be your forte. And then you went to, to, sorry, to EastEnders, the bit where it was good, really. Yeah, um, <laughs> the golden mirror. The golden years. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I did, so did that, and then that, after five years of going slightly insane, storylining 500 episodes of whatever it was of EastEnders, um, I got a very nice call. I mean, obviously I had to interview, but I had one of generally one of the best calls I've ever had from Julie Gardner letting me know that I got the job on as script editing what would be David's first season. So, and so you yeah. are, you worked across series two and series three. Yeah, so I, was, I so the shared series two, series three. I was it was mainly me, it was more me. I was so quite, series two. I think was with Helen Rayner. Yeah, so, so we were very, we were very split on that one. And then she was doing more writing, and um, as Brian's wife actually kind of came in. But I I did I think I did about eight or nine of that series. So, so what gossip can you give us from those days? There must be some stories of rushing scripts to Billy Piper in the middle of the night or. Um, I, just, I mean, it was annoyingly when you were saying, kind of, oh, prepare yourself with some anecdotes, my daughter. <laughs> and I was genuinely thinking, I, I just remember, I, it's one of those kind of things that I, I remember because I'd been, I'd never done 
I'm sort of closing. I'd never done a, a, a showrun show. I'd, I'd done con continuing drama. It's such a different beast. I've never done anything which, in many ways, though there's an awful lot of love in continuing drama. You know, do, doing something whereby the opportunity, the, what you could do, was, and I, I was still generally the, when Russell delivered Tooth and Claw, the script for that, which was, sort of came kind of out of nowhere. I just still think it's one of the most beautiful things. I think. Mm. It's got Queen Victoria, and he was all before he was talking about it, it's going, to, it's going to have Queen Victoria, it's going to have some monks, and it's got the Kerry and all diamond. And you're coming, kind of that'll work somehow. And, and it did, and it's a and beautiful. A what? And a werewolf. And a werewolf. And, a werewolf. and I, I, got, I remember spending actually time working out the logic of how that werewolf worked. <laughs> um, and it does, it makes scientific sense. They, uh, they were great days because we were, we were probably all there at the same time, those first two. David Tennant series. Yeah, I remember your arrival. Oh, do you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a very exciting time. Mm. Like, literally, Russell would say, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Mm. And it would appear. And you, you were working alongside Edward Thomas, who was yeah. the production designer then. So your role was his. I was, um, uh, I was there from the, my first job was on the second block of the first series with Chris Eck um, as a standby art director. But I'd already been um, art directing and designing on other things before that but got the, got the call to come in for an interview for Doctor Who and, um, and you know, such a scale of a show, you just went, wanted to be part of it anyway. So I was on the floor, which is kind of, still where my heart is a little bit really, yeah. you know, so it was kind of cool being part of that creative process. So standby that. art director is, is, as you say, the, the production... It's the art department representative on the floor while you're filming. Yeah. So you watch the monitor, um, you try and uh, uh, create, it, the, the way I used to always say is to create paintings out of what you see on the monitor, you know, so you, it's just things as simple as you tweak props and stuff just to make it aesthetically pleasing, but also it's your responsibility for everything that's in the script story-wise to work and be there from the graphics on computers to the props that are needed to how the set works and comes apart and stuff. Yeah. Because I'm assuming the production designer is probably working on the next block or another episode or something yeah, else, so yeah, they yeah, can't yeah, at the be same there. time as well, yeah. So you've got a lot of resp responsibility to yes. realise his yeah. dream. Yeah. And, um, yeah, my first night, I think it was, or second night, we, we was the um, uh, Victorian episode with uh, Charles Dickens uh, on a street in Swansea with, I think it was 24 horses, 12 carriages, uh, 300 extras, um, all in Victorian and snow. Uh, and um, as we read, Ed's there handing over to the director, obviously, and then he just turns to me and goes, right, you're a chance trap. <laughs> <laughs> and off you went, and you kind of go, you know, you sink or swim, you just go, Ugh, and get on with it. Really. Kind of took everyone by surprise. I mean, you guys, possibly the younger ones here, don't realise that when Doctor Who came back, made by BBC Wales, no one knew if it was going to be a hit or a success or anything. No, and uh, you know, the scale of the show as well was, you know, um, you're working 12 to 14 hour days um, quite regularly, and um, by kind of November, just before, you know, by, the, by the end of November, the people were really on their knees, you know, it was really tiring. And they did a really clever thing, they showed us a rough cut of episode one, of Rose, and I've never seen uh, a room full of people, I mean, these are, you know, hadn't, um, professionals of the industry get so excited about something and just go, oh my God, we're part of something special, you know? And, and the rest of the series was just even, you know, we went after that, we filmed um, uh, the, uh, the famous two-parter that Stephen Moffat wrote, the, the, uh, the great the line, are you my mummy? Yeah, yeah. The Empty Child, yeah. Empty Child, And I never remember the second one. Doctor's uh, Answers. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's um, why I'm and here. That was, and, that, and, we, <laughs> and we filmed that in January and February in South Wales in the most appalling conditions. When yeah. Everyone just... You know, because there were lots of nights and, and stuff. And everyone just get on with it because we, we were so energised by what we'd seen. I think people think that working in TV is glamorous and it's not. Oh, it's, oh, 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 especially oh. not Doctor Who. <laughs> you're in well, it can be at times, but, you know, no, mostly not. But, yeah. but when you're in a muddy you're... field in, in Brecon at mm. uh, four o'clock in, in the morning. In the, but you want the, the money to right. be on screen. Rather exactly, than. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually all, all really important. Doctor Who is made for a relatively small budget, I guess. And you've got to make everything appear as wonderful, as glamorous as you can. Yes, it's not yes. always easy to do. No, well, that's part of the um, smoke and mirrors, isn't it? I often start, um, state that what my job is really is a con man. <laughs> a, a script and weirdly, really, very few people laugh at it. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> they all go, yes, it's him. Yeah. So, um, so before we come back to where we are now in Doctor Who, mm. you both then left and did other things. So Simon, you, you joined Tony, Tony Jordan's team, is that right? So yeah, so I'd worked with, um, I'd worked with Tony on EastEnders and he was setting up an a independent production company called Red Planet and he said, do you so want to come in? Tony was effectively the lead writer on EastEnders at the time. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, he yeah, had a kind of serious consultant. He, he really never left for ages, and he, but he kept doing other things. But 
he um, yeah, so he was setting up, and he his so Red Planet for the first couple of years was me as my first incarnation as head of drama, comma Wales. <laughs> um, but it was me in the shed in the bay, and him in his <laughs> shed in Buckinghamshire, and we yeah, it was very it was a very small thing. We did Nativity through BBC Wales. We did a few other things, but then Death in Paradise sort of arrived in that. Is, has been a sort of juggernaut really for that for that company and has obviously sold ridiculously around the world. And so, what was your involvement in Death in Paradise? Um, I developed it right from the beginning. So, I was it was I was mentoring a writer. It was through our writing competition and a writer uh, called Robert Thorogood. And we were sitting in a, we were essentially going through his ideas for shows and seeing whether any of them worked. And he talked about just talked about something about. Um, I think it was something about fish. There was a trawler-based show, which we're thinking that's probably not going to fly. Um, and then he had an idea for Caribbean Cops, which I think at the time was called Caribbean Cops. Um, and in that meeting, we sort of pared it down a bit, to, but had a very simple idea and how we wanted, you know, what, what we wanted it to be, which is kind of doing a bit of Agatha Christie, what's, what's not to love about a sort of a winter show set in the Caribbean, classic fish out of water, British detective. And it has done insanely well. Indeed. And did you have much say in the, the casting and, and so on um, so, so yeah, because... well, initially there was a different person attached right from the beginning, um, who I'm not sure, I don't think I will mention because I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to mention. Um, but then he, um, yeah, and then, yeah, so throughout I've been involved. So I was, I was producing, co-producing the first series and then, but all, all the way through, mainly doing lots of imagining murders. <laughs> um, my wife is slightly nervous of the fact that. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> sat next to a, a con man and a would-be murderer. Exactly. Here. I think yes. I think I would over-elaborate is my biggest problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And Arwa, you of course stayed with the world of Doctor Who a bit because you worked on Sarah Jane Adventures and yep. Wizards vs Aliens, etc. So yeah. you stayed within the fold. Yeah, and Sherlock, which was kind of yeah, Stephen Moffat's not vastly removed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Sherlock's been a massive success. You must be yeah. very proud of that. Oh, incredibly. Yeah. And yeah, it's done, you know, it's opened doors for me. It's given me opportunities as well. But it was, um, you know, it, it had to be something quite special to take me away from a show like Doctor Who. You know, like like, like yourself. Yeah. Um, when you're involved in it, it's a great big family, and it's one of the greatest shows in the world to work on. Uh, but then when I heard the rumor about that they were going to do a modern day version of Sherlock, I was like, oh, yeah, please, yes managed mm. to get myself involved. And this time you were production designer on that, as yes. opposed yeah. to yeah. standby and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, well, I, I did two series of standby on Doctor Who, then I did two series of supervising art director, which is essentially, you're then off the floor, you're the um, second in command to the production designer. So it's your job to um, fulfill his dreams, essentially. You know, so it's whatever, there's requirements of the script, and what the designer wants is it, you then actually facilitate it and organize the construction, the prop department, the fabrication departments everything you need to make it happen. Almost a bigger job. Uh, it can be, yeah, because you, know, um, it, you, can, you can fall on your, fall, on your face sometimes on it, and uh, equally for, the, for a designer who doesn't have a strong um, supervisor and director, yeah. it can equally be difficult, you know? So it's, um, it, it, and it's a great, you know, both, and my supervisor and director of late, um, David Schirmer, both of us come from being standby art directors, so we know what it's like being on the floor in yeah. those headlights. Um, when everything, if everything is starting to look like it's going wrong, you, you, we know that that's where you need to, to kind of get your resources to look after those guys. So it works quite well for us. And sure, they've all been yeah, ex wonderfully successful. Uh, I was looking at what else you've been um, doing. You've done. You, I didn't realise you were involved in Keeping Faith, which of course has been yes. wonderfully successful. Yes, yeah, so yeah. You've yeah. been very proud of that. And you know Eve already. You work with Eve. Yes, I've worked with Eve, Eve a lot over the years and various things. Yes. So you know, she's she's a force of nature herself. So it's um, it's great fun working with her anyway, you know, and um, from the, what was a very tiny budget local, local uh, show, both and shot back to back in Welsh and English as well. So it was yeah, so for those of you who don't know that Eve Miles, who was previously in Doctor Who and Torchwood, uh, they did the show Keeping Faith, but it was also shot in Welsh, back to back, literally back to back. And Eve learned Welsh L to be able to do it. She learned Welsh for it, yeah, which is incredible. How is her Welsh? Is it good? Uh, it's incredible. Honestly, it's, it's unbelievable. And uh, the best description I think I, I've ever heard about someone, because she's obviously well, she grew up here, and she said it was like someone had finally tuned in a radio station that she'd been hearing off and on for years. You know, and she had a great story. She said she was in um, John Lewis in town and heard uh, someone speaking Welsh to each other, asking where something was, and she'd been interrupted their conversation because she understood it. <laughs> she said, oh, it's over there. <laughs> you know, um, I'm, quite, I'm really proud that she'd understood the question, which is great, I think. Um, so to bring you back up to date to where you are mm -hmm. now, Simon, you joined... BBC Studios back last summer, I think it was, wasn't it? Indeed. Um, now as head of drama, 
Hang Comma on. Wales. No, you say I can't get it right, Ed. Well, Head of Drama, Comma Wales, BBC Studios production. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it, I mean, say, it, as, as, as discussed before, it is um, now the BBC has. Well, actually, when I arrived, it was in three bits. Um, now it's in back in two. Um, but it is. Yes, the making part of the BBC is separated off to become an, an independent, essentially a giant indie, as it's been been described. So we can. So we all understand how the BBC is funded by the licence fee, what we call the BBC, uh, and previously that company made television shows as well. Yeah. So the that, BBC Worldwide did all the commercial stuff. Basically, the BBC Group yeah used to be BBC Worldwide at one side and the BBC Public Service. Public Service, the making part of Public Service, has now moved out. Of yeah. that, um, which is studios, and we are now down, obviously down in the bay. Um, subsequent to that, when I arrived, they always said when I arrived that with the, the direction of travel would clearly be worldwide, and studios would merge. Yeah. That happened. God, it's about three or four months ago now. Whenever it was, um, I, it, April. A, quite, a, it's a rate of change. Yes. Anyway, so that has now essentially made us obviously a very sort of strong and dynamic sort of distributor and maker, and means that there's a quite a lot of sort of financial stability built into that. But what it also means is BBC, BBC Studios, can now make programmes for other people, not necessarily for BBC. Yeah, we can, yeah, we, and that which is, which is really exciting. I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because obviously we also, you know, the ideal circumstance is, is that we still make a show for the, B, you know, we make a show for BBC One, like Doctor Who, which everyone loves and millions of people watch, and it's distributed by BBC Studios distribution. But yeah, we can now, I mean, Good Omens, which I'm making, we're making for Amazon. Um, we... It does mean that there are, I mean, in the previous versions of in, um, my department, which used to essentially be in-house drama, it did mean that if you, de if you developed something and you got really excited about something and the BBC didn't want to make it, you had nowhere, nowhere else to go with it. So it does mean that we now have a really big opportunity to, to take those things, some of which we would have, you know, I think some things now we wouldn't necessarily take the BBC as the first port of call because they may not be BBC type of shows. They may not be BBC One shows, they may be ideally s at the beginning shows or something. You know, I'm now developing Welsh language shows which we never could before for s here, which is kind of exciting, hugely exciting and I can, you know, we can make for anyone at all and at, at the moment everyone is really excited to be talking to us. So you could be making shows just for Netflix or, or, or so on and so forth. Yeah. You I don't mean, have to think with the BBC One mind anymore that you can... No, I mean, that's the same. I mean it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting thing because obviously I, I come from a very BBC One sort of background. I, I, I still really love the idea of, and what's, what's been brilliant about the last couple of weeks is you kind of think it's amazing when 10 million people watch something and when people are talking about something. I've made shows for Sky, which I love and I was hugely proud of, and they're brilliant and they kind of work, but, but you, don't get that, you, don't get the, you don't get the discussion about it and you worry about kind of like, oh, it's 20,000 down on, <laughs> yeah. and he doesn't think I'm talking about thousands rather than I want to be talking about millions. So that's, that would be, you know, but I do think, I mean, we, what, particularly for someone like me who, I mean, and, and like you, I mean, we, we are quite genre people. I love, I love science fiction, you know, from a child, I love science fiction and kind of fancy. I mean, it does mean that there are now an awful lot more opportunities to do things like that, which the BBC just can't have that much of that sort of thing. It has to appeal to a, you know, a, a much broader base of people. So very exciting future for Danny Roth Lot then. There's a lot more I would, I would say so. I mean, there's a palpable excitement. <laughs> um, and, um, so what's your involvement with Doctor Who? You kind of, do you oversee it? You know, if they get busy making it, and if there's a problem, they go, Simon, help us out? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think overseeing is probably the, the classic thing. I mean, I'm, I, I tend to be, you know, a different now, but I mean, you know, Matt and Chris and you know, and Sam and you know, they put this team together. Where, you know, they have made, they have made the show. I'm not, you know, I'm not the maker of the show, and they put a brilliant team together, and it works really well. And they're the ones that deserve the plaudits. I, I, you know, I swan in every now and again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it's it's that kind of interesting thing about it. Like in many ways, I'm I'm sort of responsible rather than hands on. Yeah. So I need to. I mean, my main thing is just to make sure they have what they need. And Arwa, so you came back as production designer. How did that come about? Did you know Chris already? Um, yes, I knew Chris. I never directly worked with him. Um, uh, I was involved with uh, one or two of his scripts way back. Um, but I, I was never involved in Tortured whilst he was there, really. Um, but I knew, I knew him. You yeah. know, I'd met him at Rothlock and yeah. various things. Um, 
I'd had uh, I'd had an interview actually for um, when Michael took over. So it was, um, I was told it was down to the two of us, but I, who knows? It could have been twelve people. <laughs> um, uh, and then, and it was um, so when it was time uh, when Michael was leaving and the, the change, and I had the call to go for an interview. I was kind of going, yeah, this could be interesting. You mentioned Michael, and obviously it's probably about six, seven weeks since he passed away, yeah, which is yeah, yeah, devastating shock, news. Yeah. Um, did you work closely with him at all at any point? No, or? never. No, I've I met him a few times. You know, I'd um, spoken to him about uh, about various things in the, in the BBC <laughs> canteen, weirdly. Yeah. Um, but no, I'd never worked. With, we'd never worked together. Fantastic designer, and, and yes. sadly missed. Yeah. Um, so sorry, you were saying. Uh, so you. So I had, a, I had a call to go for an interview. Um, I was working on a on a film in Belgium at the time, and. Um, when they were holding the interviews in uh, in Cardiff, I was actually um, at the uh, I think it was the Euro, uh, Eurostar depot in uh, in Brussels, about to get on, and I had a phone call saying there was a problem on set, so I had to phone and apologise that I couldn't make it to Cardiff and go back and deal with what was happening on this film. I thought that's it, you know, yeah. it ruined it. Um, uh, and then they came back and said, oh, yeah, well, can you Skype or anything? So <laughs> a, a week later, I was actually flying to the Isle of Man as part of this film and did a Skype interview um, whilst at an airport <laughs> trying to be kind of in a corner quietly. Uh, uh, and, but it, it, being um, Chris and Matt, it, it was quite fun doing it, you know, and the, and the palpable joy that they had for the show came over even, even over a, um, a Skype interview on a phone, you know, they, they really had this, this amazing kind of uh, vision and, and the joy for the show. And I think I got kind of wrapped up in that and was kind of getting quite bubbly back and I, and I must have gone quite well, so they offered me the job. <laughs> Well, you've done an incredible job, uh, and I think the most recent episode on Sunday, we finally got to see your piece de resistance to the TARDIS. Yeah, finally. Um, we've got a small video clip uh, of that and also a bit of behind the scenes, which you've probably seen before. Can we play that second clip in, please? Um. Well, you'll always be remembered as a man that put the custard creams on the TARDIS. Yeah, that's one thing, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, when did you start designing that? Was it when you were seven years old? Um, uh, possibly. <laughs> uh, no, it was, you know, you, I don't know, I've been asked this a lot, and it's kind of, there must have been something in the back of my head whilst I was on the show before. You know, you always kind of consider, oh, I might be able to do this, do that. But it was actually, you know, once I've been offered the job, you immediately go, Holy crap, right, I've got to do a TARDIS. Um, you know, at the same time, I was going, yes, I've got to do a TARDIS. You know, so you, they go hand in hand, really, this expectation and the honour. Um, so I went with, a, with a, a few mood boards to see um, Matt and Chris uh, with this kind of crazy idea. And, uh, and in all fairness, Chris just went, well, just let your imagination run wild, go as crazy as you want. You know? uh, and I was like, you know, man up from heaven, it was just like, yes, come on in, right, um, let's have fun. Did you ever think uh, you were going to do something completely different, like get rid of the console or anything like that? No, could... no. You know, there are certain things you have to keep uh, adhere to. You know, you, you need the console. Um, it needs to have six sides. You know, um, I wanted to play with the idea of hexagons and circles again. Um, the rondelles have always been there. I've played with them a little bit on this to try and uh, do something a bit different. 
But the, the, what I wanted to do more than anything was um, play with the, with the dimension element of the name in that I didn't want it to feel like a, um, a, the, the, sh wall, the ship had walls, if you like. So that's why it's deliberately not a solid wall anywhere, and they, and they don't connect. Every wall in there is actually separate and, and um, uh, quite fragmented so that it feels like it keeps going. And that was the idea. And then, so the inner rondelles, we put um, uh, infinity mirrors in them, which I'm not sure has come over um, properly on, on screen yet. You can see it in some of the publicity photos that they've released. Uh, so that even when you're walking around within it, it kind of has this extra dimension, you know? So you're looking in these infinity mirrors that go through and you run the back and it's, and it finishes. So it so although we've seen that scene already, there's a lot more to discover about the TARDIS and we'll, well see. There's more. always more to discover about the TARDIS, isn't there? For, forever and ever, yeah. you know? Whereas every script you get, there's, there's another bit that's been written and you go, oh, right, how are we gonna do that? <laughs> yeah. So when you get your first script, and uh, I mean, that first episode, which was up absolutely brilliant. I was saying earlier, because I, I used to work on the series and I, and I left and I almost didn't want to watch it. And I just, it was just Doctor Who. I loved it, absolutely brilliant. But that first episode is pretty much set at night, more or less. How do you cope with that, thinking, how, how am I going to make it look exciting at night? Well, it, sometimes it, it can make night look more exciting. It gives you more, more, um, more, more ways to use light and colour and, and use shadow and light and, and dark pools and stuff, you know? And part of this kind of cinematic universe that we've tried to create this season is, um, it, it, you know, most uh, old school film noirs, for example, use, utilize those light and dark elements. And to, to go more cinematic, and especially with those lenses that we've been using, um, it actually, if anything, helped, I think, rather than, than made it more difficult. It does look 10 steps up from how it's looked before. It looks phenomenal. It's just look. I think it's different. You know, it's a. Um, it, it's survived a very long time as being a quirky um, British show, which is which is brilliant and done well. But in this world we're in now, where people are watching these amazing shows on Netflix and Amazon, and and you know, no one cares that, that it's a BBC budget. No. They, you have, you get seen and compared to these shows. You know, so you you've got to try and 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 get it to look that, that way, which is sometimes can be difficult. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the concerted effort by everyone involved is why it's looked so good, I think. Because it's not just you, is it? It's obviously costume makeup and so on and so oh, forth. Costume makeup, uh, cinematography, you know, um, everything. You know, uh, the actual operators of the cameras, you know, the movements they get into it. The directors have a very, very um, clear uh, effect on how it looks. It's a, it's a very much a team effort. And for the second episode, you were given a gift, of course, of f filming overseas. Yes, you call it a gift. <laughs> um, you know, it's one of those things where everyone goes, oh yeah, the glamour, like you were mentioning. Um, you know, but uh, at the same time, yes, it's great, and it, uh, the opportunity to go abroad and, and film is fantastic. But at the same time, we were kind of going into filming in South Africa straight after Christmas. Um, and we were also getting ready to film in the UK as soon as we got back. Mm -hmm. So essentially, uh, I, I was working with two teams in two different hemispheres at the same time. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which is quite, you know, a, a great challenge. and it, uh, in the end, I hope um, didn't look too seamless. <laughs> oh, it did look seamless. It didn't look seamless. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so when you can film in an alien landscape, I mean, some parts of East Cardiff are pretty out mm -hmm. there. Uh, what's the advantage of, of going abroad, Simon? Why do we see more and more shows going abroad to shoot? Well, for me, I think there's an essence yeah. of light, and you've shot in South Africa. You've done a lot. In South I've done a lot, yeah. lot in South Africa. I mean, South Africa also has the. I mean, you're talking about working with two teams. Also has the huge advantage of being on the same time zone. So it's it's really. That is a big advantage in, in working there. But I mean, certainly around, I mean, you, we, we shot in the Atlantis Dunes. I mean, when you're at, at Atlantis Dunes, I mean, there is something kind of completely otherworldly. Oh, yeah. About and, it. and there is, when you, when you see, you know, yes, um, uh, for anyone understands post production, there's grading where you can tweak colors and stuff in, uh, that's been shot on dig uh, digitally or even um, analogy now. Uh, but there is something about um, the way light works, you know, uh, you know, you know that it's different. You know, we haven't gone to, most of our um, dunes down, yeah. <laughs> down the coast, and you know, it does look different. You, it feels slightly different to what you're used to seeing. So therefore, it feels alien. I, I'd like to ask some stuff about what's coming up. I, I can see the BBC publicist and the, my peripheral vision there ready no. to spring forward if, uh, <laughs> if we get any gossip. But, but we do know that next week's episode is a, a historical episode. Yes. Is there anything you can say about it? It's, it's the, the story of Rosa Parks. It's set in 1950. Mm -hmm. so that's all we can possibly know. Right? You've you really nailed it with that description. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. There's nothing more we can say. Secre secrecy is a huge part of Doctor Who, and, and you've done brilliantly this series by keeping everything so quiet, which is incredibly hard to do, so well yeah. done on that. I mean, 
you, 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 you there's, a, there's, a, there's a secret to that, you know. What you do is you don't tell anyone. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the big thing. Yeah. But so, do you literally turn up somewhere filming, and people say, "Oh, are you filming Doctor Who?" You just can't say. Or? No, I tend to. I, I very rarely lie to people, even though I, I might be a conman, but I'm not a very good liar. Um, <laughs> so you know, if, if we're there and people ask what you're doing, you say Doctor Who, but you try you appeal to people's better nature, and mo most of the time people will keep secrets for you, or you know, will keep. You, but it's very rarely people want to spoil. So a very very small minority that would like to do, like to do spoilers actually, yeah. which spoil it for a vast majority. So you know, it's. Um, Overall, I find it's it's not too bad to you, you say we're doing this, but please don't yeah. please don't tweet a picture of it. People are generally it. incredibly supportive of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. You've got the advantages as well that you know you, you don't have to talk about it at home because you you work with your wife. Yes, <laughs> yes. So Claire is the makeup makeup uh, designer, yeah. designer on, yeah. on Doctor. How does that work? Do you? Uh, um, it, it surprisingly works quite well because both of us know our, our, each other's schedules rather than when we're working on different shows. It can be a bit more about oh you know I'm far more busy than you. Um, but uh, while we're on the same show, it kind of, you, can, you can make it work a bit better. So just slightly moving away from Doctor Who before we come to some audience questions. Sam, have you got any shows coming up that you're developing or you're in a position where you can start telling us about things you're working on? Um, no, not really. Um, I mean, as I say, we, we've got, from my arrival, where we didn't really have anything because the way the nature of studios come into being, we had a, a blank slate, in fact. Um, I think we've now got a really exciting. I've got Kelsey Richards in, who's my head of development, and I think we have a brilliant thing. At, some, at one end, we've got enormous. You know, I was aware that we've got some enormous comic book adaptation things, which, if we get to make those, will be quite something. And at the other end, as I say, we've got um, incredibly low budget or you know, low budget things, which I think are really brilliant Welsh voices. So I think it's, the whole point is to have a to have things which are quite distinctly here, as well as yeah. things which. Part of my, my brilliant vision when I kind of came in, it was to build out from Doctor Who because that's the thing that we make amazingly well here. But also, I am charged with making shows that represent Wales where possible. It's, it's important to you that things feel Welsh, they're made by Welsh people in Wales wherever possible. Well, yeah, I mean, that, our team, we are based here, and, and I think that's one of the things that you know, I was well, excited I about the, doing. That's the, why this industry is so big now, is yeah. that from those first years of Doctor Who, uh, it brought, um, you know, who people who are now producers and directors, who were first ADs or, you know, actors, whatever, brought them down here. And they saw how good uh, a local crew and um, services and everything there was and how, and how good at, and at making things they were down here, that it brought more and brought more. So I think Doctor Who is very, very, very um, central to this boom in um, production in South Wales. Because obviously the brilliant stuff that BBC does, but it's not just oh, no, BBC it, making you know, drama here. That, no, it's it's yeah. phenomenal, the industry here. Yeah. It, it's fascinating to think that Wales is now known as the place where big drama is made, mm, so yeah. actually fantasy sort of based mm. uh, drama. Yes, and us versus Northern Ireland. Uh, they, well, they, they, yeah, yeah. they have a show. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> and I guess it's, it's Russell and Julie we got to thank for that, for what they did. Oh, yeah, yeah, hugely. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant, okay. Um, I'd like to talk to the audience now, or we'll turn to the audience rather. We've got uh, some time. To take any questions, I can see a hand up straight away there, sir. Um, I've got three questions. All right, okay. Um, we can hear you and I can repeat them if, they, if um, need be, so. First of all, if I've been a fan of Doctor Who, Oh, there is a mic coming. Oh, bear with us. I'll do my best to explain it, so thank you. I've been a fan of Doctor Who since John Pertwee. So I'm going back, so I was born in 66, so I was too young for William Hart and Patrick Troughton. Then everyone says, who is your doctor? And everything, they are the same character. Yeah. First question is, um, if this doctor, whoever she or he might be, speaks different languages, not the Welsh language. Interesting, so we never... So you could, have a, you could have something set in Wales some time ago and the, and the doctor has to translate it into English? So it might be by BT Wales, and she could speak the Gaelic as well. But while she's out of line, it's made by BT Wales for, and it was a made, probably made in London, but BT Wales underneath. It's a superb production, but she should, should speak well. She wouldn't. Well, David, so what, and she speaks, she's translated by the TARDIS, isn't yeah. she? So she speaks. Yeah. We, we don't hear the alien languages on alien mm. planets either, I suppose. But you could, have a, you could have a, the other thing, she should have a Welsh actress playing the character. I well, mean, you could have done a good, or, or the, one, the, the one who plays in 
Do you think there's too many cats So we've, we've, had a, we've had a Scottish actor playing Doctor Who. We've had a, we've got one from Yorkshire now. So three. We can, we can move on to Welsh for the next one. The other thing mm. is, um, in, the, in the olden days, going when there's oldies, there's no cliffhangers anymore. It's only one episode. I mean, it's, 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 what the hell was that about? <laughs> like the um, Peter Capaldi is knocking down a block of ice. And that episode is, I mean, when he was in a castle, it kept being strangled. It's, it's what a busy day he had. <laughs> and the, 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 the other thing is, in, when Tom Baker was playing the Doctor, there is going to be a second console, control room. Yes. So is that coming back? I, I don't can't tell me anything. <laughs> the, um, the public has well, you, there, You've but answered but your own question there. We yeah. can't tell you anything <laughs> that's coming up. But uh, you've certainly clarified what a huge Doctor Who fan you are. Thank <laughs> you for that. Um, next question. The chap up there in the red, if you could uh, pass that microphone up. Um, I've just got two, so it's sort of going oh, it's down. It's okay, as long as they're good questions. Um, yeah. well, um, it, obviously, you guys have worked with uh, sort of the series for a long time, and I was just interested how, with Doctor Who being such a sort of showrunner-driven programme, with the sort of authorship of it, how your experience of working with Russell and then Stephen and then Chris, and how the three of them are, are different in their approach to it. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Oh, well, do you want to ask? Because you've worked with all three, haven't <laughs> Thank you? Thank so. you very much. Well. <laughs> um, uh, they're very, very... They're, all three of them are very different um, individuals, you know, but um, uh, what carries the same across all three is their love of the show, and, the, and at the heart of it, they're fanboys, right? So um, the conversations are remarkably similar. <laughs> because when you, especially with me, because when you're, talk, you're talking about sets or props, generally... So, so it tends to be excitement about, oh, well, we can do this, or we can, we'll make this prop, or we'll make that, you know. So it, it becomes very much a joyful thing. And, and that, when you get to that point, they're exactly the same. Do you think part of the reason that Doctor has been so successful in the 21st century is because it has been showrunner-led, as opposed to previous uh, incarnations of the show? Is it the fact that it's a single creative vision holding it all together? Um... I mean, well, it's, I, mean, I mean, it's one of those kind of fulfilling. I mean, I'm well, it has been, so yeah. this, so, this, yeah. is, this <laughs> is where we are. There's not another, now, aren't they? You know, yeah. absolutely. No matter what, which book they grammar you look at, their children are led. Yeah, you know? I mean, I think it is, I mean, it's brilliant for the teams. I mean, when you have somebody who has, I mean, they are such complicated shows, to do, and you need somebody who has that passion and is holding all that stuff in their head and holding holding the feel of what they want it to be. And I think, you know, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I didn't work with Stephen, so, uh, you know, I can't, I can't speak for him, but both, you know, Russell and, and Chris have a, such a clear view about what they want, to, you know, both the inner fanboy, but also really wanting, to, you know, really wanting people to, loving that kind of, loving the Doctor more than anyone else, wanting the world to love yeah, them. And, and, that, and that's another thing that all three have in common, really, is that um, you would get a very clear answer of what's right and what's wrong. You know, yeah. um, in their vision of what that universe or world yeah. is, immediately, you know, oh no, that won't work. Oh yes, oh yeah, oh yes, more of that. Yeah. So they've got the confidence yeah, to yeah, the, yeah. the yeah. final yeah. word on stuff. Yeah. Did you have a second question? Yeah, sorry, very quickly. Yeah, second one was um, with the, uh, this most recent series. Um, there seems to be a really good push on kind of relaunching, completely not to be massively successful, which is high ratings and all that sort of thing. Um, was there? Um, was that just because it was a new Doctor, or was, was there a feeling that? There was, because I, I personally, as, as a fan, I absolutely love everything Stephen Moffat did. Um, but was there a sort of sense of we need to slightly redirect things a bit? Was the music well, I, th I don't think that, when, when you look back at when Matt Smith mm -hmm. started, there was a similar thing. So I think, mm -hmm. and when, um, not so much with David, because it was a kind of a, uh, but when Chris was starting, you know, and when Doctor was being relaunched, I think it happened all, with all three times. Uh, um, it might not have happened for a while, so it seems maybe like it's bigger. Um, but uh, no, I think I think that's not true. I, th I think if you look at the back of the history of Doctor Who, it, it did that a lot. So after the first six years, it suddenly went colour and became earth-based. And uh, it, it's part of the reason of Doctor mm -hmm. Who's success is it reinvents itself every four or five years, I guess. Yeah. Well, there is no. It's one of the you know it's one of the um, opening uh, lines Chris gives. Um, you know, is that there, there is no other show like it. You know, it's, it's remarkable in its uniqueness, really. But were you, were you ever told by Chris, let's do something completely different? Um, no, not completely different, because it is Doctor Who, you know. That's, that's the thing. There, yes, we've, we've changed lenses, we've changed the kind of, um, maybe the way it's shot and stuff, but then, uh, you know, that was changed a few years Before, back yeah. as well. And, yeah. you know, to, um, the change from uh, standard definition to high definition made massive differences, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. There, like you say, it develops. It can't, yeah. it keep, that's the remarkable part about the show, really, and why it's, and its longevity, 
is that it, it's able to adapt and morph itself to fit the current trend. It's a show about mm. regeneration on many Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. The show itself regenerates. I think. Thank you for those questions. Brilliant. Um, more questions, please. Hands up if you've got... If you could pass the mic in front of you. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, small one for Arnold, really, about the, uh, the TARDIS, but um, obviously it's such a prestigious set, and when you got the job, um, you must be, obviously you must have been so excited about it, but once... Once you're sort of down at the drawing board or the computer, sort of on day one, you've got all these ideas sort of all floating about in your head. What, what's your sort of starting process of it? You know, how do you get that down on paper and sort of technically, how do you sort of go and start about, you know, creating I guess such someone else a... Could do it. Um, <laughs> you know, I work, what I, I work very closely with a concept artist and a drafts person. So we had, I would have meetings with both of them. We'd discuss things and I'd show references and stuff and then I'd send them off, and then we'd have another meeting, and I'd have more ideas and more stuff, and then they'd have drawn something up, and we'd go, oh, that's cool, well, maybe we can tweak this and that. So it's, it's a very collaborative effort, but um, from that initial kind of uh, mood board and elements, and there was elements that I had in my head that I really wanted to keep and, and do, um, and I'd read this, <laughs> I'd read this um, very highbrow article about time crystals uh, <laughs> in some physics magazine that I'd come across, and I understood very little about it, but there was a line in there that I really liked that, um, that they'd managed, it was the, um, the quickest a theory had been proven in a, in an, uh, in a laboratory environment ever, from the theor theoretical to actually proving it uh, in a ridiculously short space of time, uh, that within these specific time crystals, that the laws of time and, uh, time and space as we know it didn't exist. And I thought, ooh, that's where the idea for crystals came from. So, yeah, so you know, um, so I always try and base my madness on something I'd read or come across somewhere. <laughs> that you really understood. <laughs> Which yeah. I really pretend I understood, yeah. <laughs> so the, the science in Doctor Who isn't real mm -hmm. science anyway, is it? No, but it's good to kind of have a little bit of base on, you know, you know, it's that kind of, like, all the best lies have, an, have a majority of As, as a con man says. As a con man and a murderer, <laughs> would be murderer, yeah, yeah, yeah. says. Um, but you also changed the outside. The, the police box prop has changed as well. Yes, well, you know, it's, um, it's just fun to be able to have a little tweak, isn't it? Uh, and also, you know, I, I went back to look at all the previous card eye. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. and, um, and the original police boxes uh, and, and read up about them and so on. You know, I hadn't realised myself until reading that the original box, the prop, um, was painted uh, and textured to feel like concrete because the original police boxes were concrete. Yeah. And then over time it had worn and, and it got more of, you could tell that it was wood. Yeah. You know, and then slowly the, tar the tarot had become a wooden prop. Yeah. So one of the things I, I, I've tried to do is, is give it a little bit of texture so that it actually feels maybe a little bit of both. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so there's lots of little things you tweak. And I did um, uh, the windows actually do open they have a slight uh, opening facility that, like the, the original police boxes used to have. Did, so. um, yeah, no, just a, yeah, just a little bit of fun. <laughs> and we had a little bit of fun with the colour as well, you know, to try and um, uh, uh, remember um, <laughs> making the scenic artists like hell, really. Um, just go, there's numerous layers of paint, for example. So that gonna, I don't know if it's the grey, but it looks a bit more turquoisey. Yeah, well, you go, green, it depends it? on the light. You can only uh, go blue black. In certain lights and go all the way through to kind of a bit of. There is a, a, a bit times there. a touch of teal. It's a, a touch of teal, maybe, is, yeah, <laughs> it's closer than two ways, yeah. So, um, Which is very, so it's very quite nice, you know. So as, as, as the camera moves, you, yeah. you get a little bit of difference in it. So, you obviously, Chris is a doctor expert, and uh, Simon's a doctor expert as so well. Do you ever, ever have to look up facts and information when you're. Oh, I don't have to, they tell me very quickly yeah. if I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, the original TARDIS prop that was used in 1963, when did it last until? Oh, I know the answer. Do you? Yes. Uh, what, what story did it finally um, collapse I have in? No idea. I, I have no idea. As, as Stephen, you know? Anybody know what? what, what I, know, I know they had to reduce yes. the size of it. It was Mask of Mandragora, the one after. Well done, though. Nearly, nearly yeah. there. They had to reduce the size and it to fit in the lift. And it, the, they just kept chopping yeah. bits of it yeah. down and got smaller and smaller yeah. and so on and so forth. Anyway, <laughs> no one could get yeah. in it. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting geekier and geekier. <laughs> Uh, any, any less geeky questions? Thank you for your question, by the way. Um, right, there's a gentleman all the way back in a red hoodie, and there's a microphone coming back to you there. Thank you. Um, so this has kind of um, got two questions, um, if, if that's sort of okay. Um, so my first question is, um, when you're kind of like there going over like the stories and that for the very first time before 
um, you actually go out and film them all. What's going through your head? Like, um, how is this all going to come together? How can we make this perfect? Well, before it, how can we make it perfect? There's how can we make it? <laughs> uh, um, I, I often say when, when a script arrives, it's kind of the first thing to do is to read it like a, like a novel, you know, because they're, they're always great. Um, but it, I always look at it as a collection of problems to solve. And then, so you try and work through those and solve the problems and then add some design elements to those solving problems, if you like. Um, but, so yeah, it's more about facilitating what needs to, needs to happen due to the script first. And then you add the art to it and try and make it look cool as much as possible, hopefully succeeding now and again. Well, thank you for that. Simon, do you read scripts, or, or are you sort of more hands-off? Yeah, no, I, no, I, I, I do on all those. I, I, I have a slightly, I, I see them early and, and give some thoughts. But I mean, I'm, but I say I'm not, I'm not the maker of the show. So I, I have quite a, it's quite actually nice in many ways to stand back. So I, 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 I at times get to be the kind of random other voice. I'm not that. I, I can, I can be a different. You wander person. in and go, oh, you're gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> And, you and then thought, you achieve it so well. <laughs> oh, thank you. Have you ever thought, I can't make that, I can't do it, no. how am I going to do it? You've always... Yeah, you, you never do it. You've always, you've always got to try and, and work it out some way or other. And the more you do, um, uh, the better you come at it. You know? it, it doesn't have to be the same problem, but the, work, the way you've solved the problem in the past will make solving another problem in the future easier. Yeah. I remember the, I, I, I often talk about this on the... On the first series in 2004, people, people in traffic jams next to me used to think I was crazy because I would, I'd be on the way home and I'd just be laughing to myself in the car <laughs> about what we'd been up to that day, you know, and then th that kind of every day's impossible task becomes tomorrow's um, solution. Really. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Uh, next question, please. Oh, question all the way down in front. If we can get a microphone down to, to Judith, actually, of uh, RTS. I've got a question for each of you, actually. Mm. Uh, my question to Arwell is, can you tell us about how young you were when you realised this is what you wanted to do and what role models you had, who you were seeing, uh, who actually made you realise yeah, this could be a reality? I didn't do it the right way. Um, in a room full of students, this is probably not. Uh, I, um, I've always loved films since I was a, a child, you know, that, that kind of, but I grew up on a farm in North Wales where that was not a career opportunity. But then in 1982, they started S4C, and um, I ended up acting in a, uh, one of the first uh, dramas on S4C as a kid, uh, and then got to see the, the kind of the process. Um, I really need to see that, mate. Yeah. yeah it it's, still exists. Um, <laughs> if I told you what it was, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so that, but then still kind of didn't, didn't head that way. Um, uh, I was quite good at maths, believe it or not, so I kind of went more... Uh, that way in, in school and college, um, but I didn't like it and left uh, and decided, right, I'm going to just do what I would like to do and started as a runner. I filmed around, I phoned around loads of television companies until I got a job as a runner and then just worked my way up and they kind of, um, I'd also, I, in school, I was kind of good at artistic stuff and good at maths, but you kind of got led the one way by your um, career's advice. Uh, so I, the kind of, the art department appealed to me and I ended up going that way. So and just work my way up. You're, you've obviously worked on international productions, but did you feel like your career absolutely could develop within Wales early on? Oh, that yes, you yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, that, um, and also, but, but from, you know, uh, I was in North Wales, and, but the, I came to know a lot of people um, down here, and, and the Brunt, even though there's a lot of industry in North Wales, has been since the beginning of SOC. Um, I came down here to try and work so that it was more on my own terms than up there. Uh, but... There was also this incredible um, training that people had here at BBC Wales and HTV at the time uh, that was, uh, you know, as good as anywhere in, in the UK, you know, and, and I think I, I was able to see this and learn from this for a while. And then that's what I was saying earlier in 2004 when Doctor Who started being, it brought people from elsewhere here to be able to see this, this incredible talent that was, that was here all along, but um, had never been given that kind of uh, the chance before, I think. Thank you. And my, my question for you, Simon, was presumably in your current role, then you get much more of a chance to sort of be an ambassador for the show and get to sort of see the reaction all around the world, you know, from audiences around the world, uh, to some extent. I mean, you know, whether it's the conventions mm. or whatever. And I just wondered if you had a sort of a sense of how different 
how the rest of the world reacts to it. I mean, is it, is it the same enthusiasm, the same response, the same things that people appreciate worldwide or different I think countries? so. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I must admit, I'm kind of wish, wish I'd had your question. I can't, I can't <laughs> it totally that. Um, no, I mean, I've, I've, I've only really done America, and I think America has a very, you know, a very similar feel for, very similar feel for the show to, to us. I mean, it, it has a slightly different audience. Obviously, they don't have the... The 50 years plus of, of living it and, and and embracing how we how we have, but no, I, I, I don't. I think there is such a universality about Doctor Who that I don't. I don't think there is a, a particular kind of oh, this is this is our version of it. This is what we we take from it. And I think Jodie's, you know, and this latest version just built on that really. Okay. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, if you, lady here, if you'd like to pass the microphone to her, please. Hi, so uh, a quick question for a production designer, a kind of a two-part question. What is your favorite part that you had done for the series, be it prop or a set? And the second part of that question is, In the first if, you, <laughs> if you ever had an idea, if you have some sort of idea that you really liked for the show and you still kind of hold on into it in the back of your mind, like you really like it even now, but you had to cut it because of budget or s some other... So are you talking about Doctor Who? So yes, yes, so yes, far? yes, of uh, course. It's, it, it's the TARDIS really now, you know, as a, for something of that, that iconic and um, for it finally to be out there. Because I, I think I was the most nervous person in the world on Sunday night um, for people to finally see it and find out what people thought. Because uh, it doesn't matter what you think yourself, you know, it's got to be appreciated by other people. Um, but the way it's gone down, yeah, I was very proud of it anyway. Uh, and I, the remarkable thing is that how true it is to the concept work we did nearly, I think it was nine months prior to actually filming on it. The, the end result is incredibly close to that concept that we came up with. So that's remarkable, you know, for, with, to do that within budget-ish. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, to, to actually achieve what we were trying to achieve, I think it was, that really gave a sense of, um, a great sense of achievement. I said achieve a lot then. Uh, <laughs> and it, when we showed, when we finally were ready, kind of all the lights were on and everything, and we brought people from the office down, you know, it's a big moment now because it's all everyone that's involved in the show kind of gets to come and have a look at it for the first time. And I, I might be slightly wrong of me, but it gave me a bit of pleasure that there were a couple of people crying. <laughs> Uh, when they saw it, so it's kind was of. Was that the accountants? Uh, <laughs> no, uh, he was weeping in the corner. Um, no, uh, you know, so it, it, that's that's quite a nice reaction to have. Are you are you studying production design? Are you involved in it? No, in... I'm oh right, okay. Well, I hope you're learning something today. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and oh, how, how are we doing for time? I think oh, we've got three minutes. So, is there another question? A really amazing question that's going to set the room alight. <laughs> or even an average question, but if, anyone, <laughs> if anyone's got a question, do they want to put their hands up? There we go. Everything's on you now. <laughs> so obviously, a, um, as some people might know, there was a leaked photo of the console uh, a few months ago, which obviously you tweeted about saying that you weren't very happy about. How did you feel when the BBC published the hand TARDIS handbook with a full photo in, like three days before the episode aired? Well, that's an official photo with all the colouring, so, you know, that's fine. What I wasn't happy about was that it was a rubbish photo with no lights on and everything, and that's the first thing everyone gets to see of what we were trying to achieve, so I was annoyed. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, spoilers, uh, very few people do it, and it's really detrimental to the whole thing. Um, so there's, we'd work very hard to finalise a, a look and feel for that artist that involved lighting, that involved various things. Um, so that's why I was annoyed. I think the BBC acted fast and got those pictures yeah, removed yeah, yeah, from yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. internet. I, I certainly didn't see anything, so uh, I don't think many you people You are did. scouring the internet. <laughs> I, I, was, I was looking at them, not at all. Um, well, to, to end on something a bit, a bit more positive, um, what will your legacies be on Dog 2? What do you think, I mean, apart from the TARDIS, what do you think you'll be remembered for? Custard Cream. Custard Creams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, we'll see. I mean, there's, a, there's only two episodes gone, and there's more to come. We shall find out. And Simon, obviously, you're less involved in Doctor Who now, but how do you think you, you'd like to be looked at, upon by the, the Doctor Who fans? <sighs> favourably. Um, well, uh, yeah, al always favourably. I mean, yeah, I don't mean, I, I, know. I mean, hopefully everyone, really in, in, in true, you know, anyone I've worked with on the show, everyone knows how much I love, love it and have loved it all my life. 
I'm less, I'm not so, you know, hands on with it, but I, you know, I will fight to make sure that it has what it needs and is protected. And so. of course, you did the, uh, the, the leather and lace and, and virgin novels. Yeah, I'm, I, say, it's, it's, I think it's, it, it's a show that's incredibly close to my, close to my heart and yeah, it's an amazing, a genuinely amazing show. And when you do travel the world with it, when you do see how it affects, affects people, it, it is an amazing thing that we make here. And it's been so brilliant this last couple of weeks when you see just quite how many and you know, new people being as excited as I was. That's know. the most exciting yeah. thing is there's so many new viewers yeah. that come to it, especially young girls who are connecting yeah. with Jodie. It must make you feel really... Yeah. Oh, it's amazing, yeah. You know, it, it's, that, it's like having that, for me, the, um, that first series, the, the moment um, my kids came back from school going, are you my mummy, was the kind of, oh my God, this is, mm -hmm. is it. And it's happening again now, you know. It, it's, that, <laughs> it's a that, tragic that, family um, story. Palpable <laughs> excitement, you know. <laughs> Well, it's. <laughs> I'm glad we're talking about what a success it's been already, and I hope it continues mm. to. I'm sure it will continue mm. to be. Uh, well done for your, your work, and mm. thank you very much for coming and talking to everyone yeah. today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Simon Winston and Arbel Winston. <laughs>